Hi everybody, it's Mrs. Mancuso, and since I'm not there with you, I wanted to go through the big idea sheets for biochemistry. So, uh, you got a couple options. You can sit here and go right through it with me. Um, I know that I talk fast, and you'll probably have to write down more than what I write down. Some of the things that I say, you might want to write down too. It's a little hard for me to uh, finger right on the screen and fit it all in. Or you can always do the big idea sheet by yourself and then go back through the answer keys that I posted and see if there's anything that I added that maybe you want more of. Even if you're watching the video, I do have my answer keys where I've written more than I will write on this screen. So if you would like that, just um, go right into Schoology and go into the big idea answer keys. All right, so let's get started with biochemistry. So the first thing is distinguishing between ionic and covalent bonds. So ionic bonds are when you transfer electrons and they go from a metal to a nonmetal. So for example, salt, NaCl is an ionic bond. Uh, covalent bonds, those are when electrons are shared. So when you share electrons, you might share them equally or unequally. So I'm going to put unequal with polar and then nonpolar. I'm going to put equal. These are all between nonmetals. When you have a polar substance like HF, there is a stronger electronegativity on the F atom than the H atom. So the electrons are held closer to the F than the H. That's what makes it polar. There's a pole. They're not shared equally. If you have oxygen gas, so when things tend to be nonpolar, their phase of matter tends to be more gas because there's um, equal sharing between them. It's a very symmetrical model. There's not attractions between one oxygen gas and another oxygen gas, or the attractions are so weak. Um, whereas if you have something that is polar or ionic, there tends to be more attractions between the atoms. So a lot of their physical features are due to their type of bonding and their polarity. All right, many water's properties are due to hydrogen bonding. Describe them and how they account for at least three of the properties of water. So when you see hydrogen, or when you hear the words hydrogen bonding, you want to think it's an H attracted to an O, an F, or an N. So if you have a water molecule, Here's the O, here's the two H's. The electrons are not shared equally. They are closer to the O, which makes the O have an overall negative charge and the hydrogens have a slightly positive charge. If you were going to line up another water molecule, you would do it so that there was an attraction between an O and an H. And that dotted line right there, that is my hydrogen bond. So there it is. That's the attraction between the mo water molecules. So properties of water due to the fact that it has hydrogen bonding. First of all, it's cohesive. Cohesive means that water likes water. There's an attraction from one water molecule to another. That leads to properties um, uh, like, well, there are more properties. Sorry, let me keep going with my list. Adhesion. Adhesion is because of these charges, the negative and the positive, water is going to like other molecules. So co is when it likes itself, adhesion is when it likes other things. Because there's so much attraction between the molecules, it has a high specific heat. So the specific heat is the amount um, of heat required to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. Uh, water has a high boiling point, so high heat of vaporization um, means that it takes a lot of heat to separate the water molecules from each other and break those intermolecular forces of hydrogen bonds to have them become a gas. Um, the surface that it leaves, it cools, so you can also say that a property of water is to be an evaporative coolant. Another property of water is that it makes a great solvent. So because of those charges, other molecules like an Na would also be attracted to this negative or a Cl- minus would be attracted to this positive. So things dissolve in water well because they're attracted to the O's and the H's of water. Um, another property of water is that it forms a 
Um, actually, it's this next one here. Explain the property of water described in the diagram below. What is its biological importance? So showing the hydrogen bonding in water versus the hydrogen bonding in ice, this causes the molecules to be more spread out. So it is less dense when it is a solid than when it is a liquid. So here it's a liquid, here it's a solid, here it's more dense. The molecules are more closely packed. And the wild thing, if you think about that, ice floats. It's the only liquid that we can think of that when it is a solid, it's less dense. Usually things when solids are more dense, so they would sink, but ice floats. And in nature, that's really important because if you had a body of water, if it froze and sunk, the earth would be covered in water right now obviously, and um, I mean, if the body of water froze, then the, the lake's bottoms would always be frozen. They would never melt. So it works the opposite way. The top freezes, and then the top melts. Sort of forms an insulative layer so that fish can live underneath. All right, describe the properties and draw the functional groups. So a carboxyl group is a C with a double bonded O, and an OH, the rest of the chain would go here. Um, a carboxyl group always gives an acidic property, and that's because it drops that H. So an amino acid ends with a carboxyl group. A, um, uh, what other kind of a fatty acid has a carboxyl group on the end of it. All right, a phosphate group is PO4. So the phosphorus has four oxygens around it. One, oh, sorry, imagine there's an O there. And a double bond with another O here. Each of these O's is going to take on a negative charge. So this is a very negative, a very polar group to have. You find phosphate groups in DNA, and that accounts for the negativeness of DNA, which one of the labs that we did was gel electrophoresis. So the basis of DNA moving down the gel was because DNA was negative, and it's moving towards the positive electrode. All right, sulfhydryl. That is a sulfur with a hydrogen on the end. And um, that is going to be very unique. Um, there are some proteins that have an amino acid that has sulfur in it, and it can form disulfide bridges. So that's where that one shows up. Uh, hydroxyl group is an OH. You see that on an alcohol. Um, it gives a, po a polar um, quality to it. An amino group is an N with three H's. Um, it actually starts out as an N with two H's and it picks up another H. So because it will pick up an H, it is a base. All right, and an aldehyde is on the end of the molecule. You have a carbon with a double bonded O and a hydrogen. So it's that double bonded oxygen, which gives it a little bit of negative, um, but it's pretty nonpolar. It's not, it's not very drastic there on the end because that double bond. All right, describe the four levels of protein structure and how it affects function. All right, the primary level is just the order of the amino acid. So what is the protein that you have? Does it first use lysine and then proline and then serine and then tryptophan? What are those amino acids? Secondary structure, oh, I want you to think of the, um, what do you call those, pipe cleaners that we used. So just the straight out pipe cleaner, that was my first level of structure. And the second one, remember how I curved it around like this? That's an alpha helix. And that is due to hydrogen bonding, and it's repeating over and over again because it's due to the amino end and the carboxyl end being attracted uh, to each other. Peptide bonds form between each one, but then there are still molecules that will show that attraction. So it really doesn't have anything to do with the side chains. It's a regular repeating unit due to the uh, amino end and carboxyl end. Another way you could do it is a beta pleated sheet. Sorry, it's hard for me to write with my finger on these things, but a beta pleated sheet would go back and forth like this. All right, what else do we have here? Tertiary structure, this is all about the folding. So tertiary is all about attractions between the side chains. The side chains are the R group of an amino acid, and basically there's three different kinds of folding that you see happen. So if this is my secondary structure and I folded it, it might end up 
looking like that and it might fold over on itself multiple times so it gives it a very unique shape and that unique shape allows it to do its job so this part right here might become an active site that exactly fits my little substrate molecule right here okay so how do we get this unique folding we get it because of hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions so this part um, might have really not liked water, so it all goes and faces the inside. It's very nonpolar. And out here, these were very polar, so they face the outside. All right, another way that it forms is there can be attractions between positives and negatives. So again, on those side chains, there might be some that have charges, and they're just attracted to each other. And the last one is the sulfur, so a disulfide bridge. All right, so let me grab another color. Let's say I have a sulfur here and a sulfur here. This will fold over on itself so they get to be next to each other. So it would bend the whole molecule. All right, and then finally, quaternary structure. This is due to multiple polypeptides interacting together. So if you have more than one amino acid chain, so we have this one that's folded this way, and then we have another one that's folded this way, and the two of them come together, and we get this. And that is my unique protein that is formed due to the interactions of two polypeptides. That's quaternary structure. A great example of that's hemoglobin. Hemoglobin actually has four proteins that make up um, its one structure. All right, next one. This one, I'm going to admit right off the bat, this is going to be a challenge for me to do on the screen. So what I'm probably going to do is one column at a time and then erase it to give myself more room. So the building block of a protein is an amino acid. Imagine, again, I'm only focused on this one right now. Those are crossed out for the moment. Don't cross them off on your paper. Just give me room to write. Elements present. Proteins have um, C's, H's, O's, and N's, and sometimes sulfur. All right, distinguishing properties. We recognize them because of the CNN. There's a peptide bond that forms so that you go CNN. Oh, I just did it wrong. Oh, my gosh. Sorry, you guys. Ooh, glad I noticed that. Get rid of that. Okay. NCC. And then another one. That's a peptide bond. NCC. And then another peptide bond. NCC. That's what they look like. And off of the middle carbon would be my R, my side chains. And so if this side chain like this side chain, it would have to fold over and be next to it. All right, functions. This is a big line. Whoops, sorry. Wow, this is difficult to do with your finger. All right, sorry, guys. Well, let's stop this.